Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Secret Origins of Mint Condition. I am your host, James, and today we are going beyond good, beyond evil, beyond your wildest imaginations, and we're going to talk about Transformers the movie, a movie that came out in 1986, not to be confused with anything that Michael Bay has touched in the recent years. And to do this, I have assembled a excellent panel of Transformers experts uh, to weigh in on this discussion. So first, I'd like to introduce our resident tenured professor. Professor Jack Adrian is here with us. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And joining us also is our expert in X-Men, Marvel Cosmic, and Spider-Man, and Transformers as well. Arco Esposito is joining us. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me again. And also joining us is our one of the hosts of the Star Trek edition of this show and a pop culture expert and 80s cartoon expert and enthusiast as well. John Whittemore is here. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. And finally, new to the podcast and the person I credit, well, one of the people I credit with introducing me to Transformers the movie in his own and in his own pop culture 80s cartoon expert but mainly transformers keith bethan is here with us today well thank you james it's delightful to be here and uh, it's a lot of pressure thanks a lot <laughs> no problem, no problem. So, i feel that every time he introduces me <laughs> <laughs> well i want the audience to know the kind of you know uh, people that we have on this podcast are really experts in their field so mm, oh boy but uh, but no pressure keith but i'm going to start with you um, so, oh dear God! <laughs> what? Since it's your first time on the podcast, I thought we'd probably all go around and do this. But maybe give us your first impressions as to what Transformers. I guess why you like Transformers, the original generation one cartoon, and maybe your first impressions about the movie itself. Well, I mean, uh, the Transformers, the movie is only the best movie from 1986, and maybe the best movie of all time. Um, I don't think that's a hot take, but um, it's fine. I'll. I'll back up my claims later on. I don't know. There's just something. Uh, yeah, Arco, I uh, love that one. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be bold. I got to be bold. I don't know. That was that was always my cartoon growing up. Actually, whenever my grandfather would pick me up from school, um, even when I had like a car seat in the car, it would uh, it would fold up and you could hide things under it. So um, I would always look uh, when I got in the car to see if there was something under the the seat. And uh, usually it was some form of transformer. There was a little. Uh, snafu in the beginning where a gobot appeared there but uh we quickly remedied that um and then only transformers <laughs> appeared there so that was nice <laughs> excellent arco what was your uh, impression of the original transformers and then the movie itself well i love the original transformers uh series uh, because i uh, had moved back from Italy back in 1980, and uh, when I was living there, uh, there was a show that I loved called uh, Jig, and uh, it was from 1975. It was Japanese uh, ma uh, manga style cartoons that, which was just mind blowing. You could actually catch the original show on uh, on YouTube, and it was very similar to what I was watching with uh, the Transformers. So it was a nice segue when I uh, when I discovered it and uh, as far as the movie wa uh, was concerned uh, like i was saying earlier to uh, before we started i caught the movie later in life uh, probably in the early 80s uh, 90s on vhs um but i had uh, a, a big affinity for what i was watching and uh, I, I loved every i loved every part of it every part of it excellent and uh, and john what are your what's your thoughts on transformers and transformers in the movie it's funny because i almost feel like they're slightly different parts of my life uh transformers the cartoon was just i don't know it was just the most fun thing in the world for me uh, uh as as this little kid because the toys were fantastic and i was always viciously jealous when i didn't get the one that my friend had whatever one that was um though i think we can all agree that when your friend got the different dinosaur from what you wanted and your parents got you the wrong one you very much felt offended um it's like, I want the T-Rex. Not not, not I, I didn't talk to my parents for weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it created lots of familial rifts. Um, but it was just such a fun show. And uh, it was right at that time when you know the toy marketing was at, was at a peak. So just so much fun. Then the movie came out. Uh, and, I, and I saw the movie. And this is like my first intense cinematic experience with all of the dramatic things that happened in the movie. And I was, oh, this stuff is dark. This is oh, this, yeah. this is intense. And <laughs> also, great. looking back, I think that's when I, you know, 
I realized there was something unique and really weird about the 1980s. Like that is, that is that the movie just, if you need, if you need a primer into what the 1980s just is out there for, you're going to find it here in Transformers movie. That's a actually a very great synopsis of it. Um, Jack, what are your, what are your thoughts on uh, the Transformers and the movie? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I'm going to make a bold statement here and say I'm I'm, I'm probably the most senior member of uh, this 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 podcast today. Uh, and so, you know, back in the Halcyon days, you know, uh, in the days of long ago, um, we did not have as much content in media as people enjoy today. And so. Uh, Transformers and G.I. Joe, I mean, they were like the pinnacle of just child entertainment. And then you had the trifecta of you had the cartoon, you had the action figures, and you had the comic book. And, and so, I mean, th- this is about as much content as one could consume. Uh, and so leading up to the the movie, uh, there was all of this hype, and it was this, this grand uh, uh, excitement that built around it because, I mean, here you have something that's great, uh, destined to be only greater. I mean, it was uh, akin to to uh, taking Star Trek the show and then Star Trek the motion picture. Again, uh, not necessarily the same emotional experience, but you know what? Maybe it is. That's a whole di- I think we'll discuss that in the course of this, this uh, in, the, in the course of this discussion. No, that's that's fantastic. Well, I'm gonna say like I was growing up, I um I was not into Transformers. I'm probably <laughs> seeming like to be the one person here. So uh, hopefully all of you will guide me uh, guide me through this conversation a little bit because uh, my I was more Thundercats, He-Man, and real Ghostbusters guy. Occasionally a, a Transformer. And there's nothing wrong with that, up. James. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, occasionally a Transformer would show up, but Transformers and GI Joe. I don't know. They were not on my radar like growing up for whatever reason. Uh, so it wasn't until, you know, uh, Keith, when I started on with you and Kevin, that you uh, your love for this movie that I actually got to see it. So it was very much like you, Arco, seeing it at a later age. And I, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, considering like the age I was seeing this movie for the first time, I was like, this this movie's great. It uh, looks great. Uh, obviously, being older, the darker themes didn't bother me. I thought it was actually kind of compelling storytelling for you know what you're dealing with as a as a kid's property, quote unquote. Uh, so I really enjoyed it and took, took a liking to it immediately. But uh, that was like, I didn't really get into Transformers until much later in life. So um now that we've all kind of weighed in, uh, I, I guess we should probably just talk about the the biggest thing of that movie. And Keith, you were talking about this a little before we went online. Since you and John both saw it while you were growing up, why don't we talk about the death of Optimus Prime? Yeah, yeah. yeah bring those, bring that energy back. <laughs> um, yeah, it's we're time gonna for bring, we're bring the group down. <laughs> well, I got to give a kudos to James because. I may have started James on Transformers, but James started me on my Transformers shirt collection because he was kind enough to iron on a patch uh, onto a a Hanes t-shirt and uh, give that to me. And I think also to Kevin, but I'm not sure. And uh, now I have a ridiculous amount of Transformers t-shirts and uh, pajama pants and other nonsense that probably should never leave the house. Well, I was happy. I'm glad you, I'm glad, wow. I'm so glad I I didn't realize I did that, but I'm glad you've you've continued with it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, going, as I was saying in the lobby before, um, I begged my mother to see this movie and Aliens. And at the time, I was six. So it's very irresponsible that I was able to see even one of those movies, let alone both of them. Um, uh, but I, I, I love you, Mom. It's fine. It's, it's I fine. mean, Aliens. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. At uh, well, six. <laughs> the crazy thing is Aliens was a cakewalk because I was I was so hyped to see any movie about Aliens um, that it really didn't bother me. And that one was a little more palatable versus the first Alien. But Transformers, like... I was not ready for Transformers. I mean, within seven minutes, they've killed most of the characters you knew and loved from the G1 series. And then within 20 minutes, uh, Optimus is dead, lying on a table. He, uh, you know, he tur- his, the life drains from his body. He turns a gray and then his head turns, his eyes fade out. And then the kid cries on top of him, Daniel. So I don't know if they were trying to make all the children in the audience cry, but mission accomplished there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I'm just picturing everybody like me tugging on their parents to, who are, who who are horrified themselves that this is yeah. happening and they thought they bring their kids to a cartoon movie and all of a sudden there's death and destruction. Yep. That's what, I love it. <laughs> it's the 80s. Yeah. John, did you have like a similar reaction seeing it when you did? Oh yeah. I I didn't see it in the theaters. I saw it on VHS. Um uh I I I think I think if I'm remembering correctly, rented it from Salem Drugs. 
back in the day they they used to rent videos um and that was like the big thing like go down the street to the drugstore get a video um and it was oh my god transformers there's a movie about this so excited so ready for this already a little bit weirded out because the 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 style was a little bit different on the cover from that and i was very like picky about my transformers which ones i liked which ones i didn't back then you know as any precocious you know second grader would be and uh I noticed this seems a little different, like something, something's, you know, not, not what I was used to with the, you know, so the happy go lucky Autobots. And then as Keith said, then it happened. All hell broke loose. And you just see that head turn, the gray body, the, the, the disintegr- it's like slight disintegration that's taking place and the weeping child. And there's a gif out there um, of, of, of this little kid being interviewed and he's like smiley. And then two seconds later covers his face and is just bawling. And that's what always comes to mind. Uh, uh, now, when I think of that moment, you're like, this is great. I'm, uh, oh, oh, I'm not crying. Oh. You're crying. And then the weeping begins. You just don't know what's, what was coming. Next. So that was, that, that was definitely intense, but I was, I was nonetheless transfixed because it was, it was just, it was against all uh, tropes that little kids got from Saturday morning cartoons and what were for us the afternoon after school cartoons, um, which is that the heroes win the day, uh, uh, nobody really gets hurt, uh, and only the bad guys have to pay the consequences. Um, so, Unless you need to sell oh, toys. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was, it was just this really intense, uh, intense reaction. I think I think that that uh, movie should have come with like the warning, like will traumatize your child. They will be talking <laughs> about it uh, thirty five years later in a podcast on this um, thing called a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen. Sorry, you're, you got to sign the contract here. You know, it's going to happen. Uh, but it, but I but I think that that was actually an introduction to to a different kind of storytelling, but on my level. I didn't feel like I was going into an adult movie expecting with adult expectations where I could say, well, that was just an adult movie. This was meant for me, but was way above my, you know, level uh, at that point. So I, I, I look back at it as like, okay, that was intense, but it, but it, it learned me things. It's a little kid that needed to, you know, grow up a little bit and understand that, you know, uh, uh, the universe is a scary place when you're in Cybertron and robots are fighting each other. You know, it's, it's not all going to be fun. Uh, but I will say that the style got to me through that movie that it was so, uh, uh, chaotic. Uh, that's one thing that always takes over the movies is, is how chaotic it is, and that that not everything followed a normal story. And I thought maybe that's just what the writers read. I am now convinced that there must have been a copious amount of drugs consumed while writing, <laughs> and filming that movie. <laughs> oh boy. Um, let me let me interject here just a little bit. I I watched. I did my homework too, just like Arco. I watched it um, two nights ago the regular way. Um, not that it matters because somehow my brain holds on to like 80% of the dialogue from that stupid movie. But, um, then I watched it again with the commentary. They rewrote the whole movie. So like the guy on the writing credits for the movie, basically they insinuated he did nothing. Um, Flint Dilly, who I think is listed as like a story consultant, he, he rewrote the whole movie and they were saying, um, so when Spike does the, oh shit line. And then, um, there's another line where Ultra Magnus says, damn it, or something. Uh, Flint Dilly said that they specifically threw those in there because they wanted the PG-13 rating because they knew they were going to crush the souls of children uh, and they were going <laughs> for the, the older demographic, basically, or for your parents to be responsible if they drag you in there like my mom did. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. I was, I was, that was one of the, one of the questions I was going to ask. Did you think the writers like knew what they were doing when they killed everybody and Optimus Prime, but it sounds like they did. It sounds like they did know what they were. They were, do. yeah, they were under directives by Hasbro to kill off all the G ones. Basically. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Uh, Jack, I mean, you saw, you were, you, as you said, you said you were more of the elder statesman of the group. Um, did, did the impact of this movie affect you the same way when you saw it? Well, you know, so this is, yes, it did, but it, it, it was almost kind of like a bait and switch because, um, you know, one of the major marketing just bonanza that they did was it, it was like, uh, this all-star cast, it, it was almost kind of like the 70s when you would have like these movies where you'd have everybody in the studio kind of filming. And so, I mean, you had uh, Eric Idle, Judd Nelson, Leonard Nimoy, Robert Stack, Orson Welles. And, and so they advertised that you would have all of these legendary actors, um, you know, in this movie. And, and so your mind was just, why would you have all these great actors in, in, in this, you know, 
children's cartoon. This has got to be the, the the greatest thing like known to man. And and you know that was also the day before obviously the interwebs, and so uh, there were no spoilers. I mean, you did not know going in that this was going to happen. I mean, uh, you, you saw the movie poster. Uh, and, and so you say, oh, wow, you know, there, there's some new, uh, you know, new characters coming out, great, some new action figures, but never, never in your wildest dreams did you think you would have to lose some of your, like, your favorites uh, in order to make room for, for the next generation. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal looking, looking at it from that perspective. I mean, it's, it's very, like, Megatron basically gets to be the 80s villain that he gets to do the most destruction. He gets to achieve his goal. Like, he does it in this movie. No other, like, Skeletor is not, like, wiping out half a He-Man at any point. So um, Megatron gets to be the guy, finally. He gets to be the villain he always wanted to be. And I find, I find, like I said, watching it when I did watch it, I thought that was very compelling. But obviously, as a little kid who's never seen Megatron kill anyone, let alone win the day, it must have been, like, really a big shockwave to see that change in the story. Yeah, and, and just the sheer aggression. I mean, the, the you know, uh, you know I, I will rip out your optics, you know? I'll kill you with my bare hands. I mean, there, there, there's just a certain grotesque brutality to it all. Um, it, 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 I love that. It, I love well, it. I mean, oh, oh, that, was, that was my next line. I mean, it, it, was, it was brilliant. I mean, and so, you know, to, to Keith's point, I mean, and the thing I think we're missing here, it was a movie of its time. I mean, some other movies that 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 came out in, in 1986, are, you know, Aliens, Karate Kid Part Two, uh, uh, Flight of the Navigator, Top Gun, um, you know, Star Trek: The Voyage Home, you know, The Fly, Highlander. I mean, so it needed to make space amongst all of these other movies to essentially remain relevant. And I mean, so I recognize if Hasbro was going to do this, they had to commit to actually attracting the audience because there was just a lot of competition out there that were willing to go and do things that, you know, a children's cartoon was not expected to do. Yeah, well, I mean, to kind of go to that point, though, I mean, we'll probably, I mean, if they went hard and the movie, as we said, we're still talking about it to this day and we have a whole podcast dedicated to it. But as I understand, it didn't do well when it first came out to the point that it they moved no. G.I. Joe, the movie, to direct to video, right? Because they were like, yes. if Transformers didn't do well, we're not wasting our time with G.I. Joe. And I think they actually they saw also them. made changes to the G.I. Joe movie because of this. And I was literally just discussing this in a D&D game I was involved in a few days ago <laughs> where where they where they were they were going to follow suit and kill off the major character and Duke was going to die. And then they just sort of add in a scene at the end. Oh, hey, they just called. He's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> yes. uh, they're like, we don't uh, we, we don't want to follow that path, maybe. Like um, and I think that's, that's hilarious that they that they that they looked at it and were like, yeah, we we, we don't want to be doing that. Um for whatever reason. Um, but it, it, the, the impact, Jack, that just blew my mind though. The rattling off you had of, of all those movies <laughs> and things that came out that year. Don't I didn't forget the rain with Charlie Sheen. What, what, do you mean, what do you mean that year? That summer. Yeah. <laughs> that exactly. summer. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Short Circuit, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Labyrinth, Big Trouble in Little oh. China, Karate yeah. Kid Part 2, Aliens, Howard the Duck. We won't talk about that. Stand By <laughs> Me, Flight of the Navigator, and The Fly. We're talking about from May to September. That is what came out. I, th- I think uh, Top Gun right before that also. So Exactly. Uh, insane. Insane. So I'm, I'm sorry. Who said – who's? I forgot who said that the uh, Transformers was the best movie that year. Oh, that would be <laughs> Stand up again, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right here. <laughs> Yeah, all right, that's good. <laughs> Come on, man. How many other 80s movies, uh, they asked the question, how many uh, power bows do you want in there? And the answer was yes. I mean, that's Transformers <laughs> the movie. And, Take and, all that and, smoke. And, and you know what? Let me tell you something. I, as I was watching it last night, the music... It just seemed like it was out of sync. I, it was, it was, but it just seemed like it was out of sync. Like in the middle of like they're talking, all of a sudden you got the touch. It's like oh, yeah. it just seemed like, yeah. it, it, like really? Is, I'm, I don't know. It just seemed like it was out of place to me. Well, you have to be, uh, you have to be six years old. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking back, it just makes sense for the eighties. Well, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's and that was the nineteen eighties. But that the music was so over the top, so corny. But also took itself so seriously. Yes, yes. Like, I, like, I agree. like they weren't. They weren't. This wasn't like Rafi composing music for kids, no. uh, which is <laughs> in and of itself like a serious endeavor. But like lighthearted. These are. These were like. These are like glam metal and yeah. like one hundred percent and 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 Weird Al. 
and they said, hey, let's, you know what, we don't have enough here. Let's get, if somebody got Weird Al's phone number, please, because we can <laughs> yeah, use exactly. to be stupid in this, okay? All right, so, I mean, that really put it over the top for me. Well, Keith, you introduced me to the soundtrack, too, separately, so I'll credit you with that as well. And I still have that soundtrack. And you also had, like, what was it, the, um, at the time, it was only a convention special edition where they had the actual score? Yeah, uh, I think Kevin had a BotCon CD, so it was like a a dual jewel case and it had the Vince DeCola score. The score is actually really good too. It's obviously not like eighties power ballads. It's all, you know, just instrumental, but it's, it's pretty good. And you can trace the entire, uh, you know, run of the movie just through the score, which is nice. You know, I still have a, I still have a copy of the copy you made of for that score. So I still have that. So, and just to go to back you, to back up your point, uh, Keith, about the greatest movie of, of that, of that year. Um, <laughs> I was listening to Robert Kirkman's talk on, uh, the Nerdist podcast a few years ago, and he said that Transformers the movie is the thing he ins- he is- aspires to write as good as that with every project that he puts out. Nice. So, and this is the creator nice. of The Walking Dead, so uh, he still feels like nice. he hasn't reached that pinnacle. <laughs> My God. <Yeah. laughs> I think it was. I think it was Ebert gave it like a zero, like a literal zero or something. I mean, it was something horrendous, and he basically one of know, them called it just a, a, a an hour and a half long toy commercial. Yeah, I don't know if that was him, but his his little blurb on it was akin to like the, you know, the Happy Madison thing where like he says, you know, we're all like dumber for having, you know, listened to this thing basically about the movie. He Like they really hated it. Well, I mean, listen, I think it's watching it like again, like for for this podcast, I think that I think the movie's like I really enjoyed the movie watching it again. I mean, I always obviously enjoyed it because we're having this podcast on it, but. This movie really moves. I mean, it was, like I said, they rewrote the script, but there is no breathing time in this movie. I feel like this movie no. like flies. And again, there's no time for grieving in this movie as much as you should be grieving, or maybe kids were shocked because as soon as Optimus Prime is dead, the next moment, you know, Megatron's being reconstructed into Galvatron, and then he's going back to Earth to blow them up again so that they <laughs> yeah. can go off on ships and try to escape it. I was like, this movie just keeps going at you 100 miles per hour. It does. It does not it let really, up. really does. And something that reminded me of that when I, I think we were all watching it at some point in the early two thousands. Again, you know, many of our rewatches that movie, and then only a few years later, um, Battlestar Galactic came came on, and I just always remember the first episode of that of that sense of constant like constantly being chased, and that literally the beats of the episode were were without a break. Um, and uh, I was thinking about it like back then, just like, oh, what, what, like, what an endurance test the movie is, uh, this Transformers thing that, that, that the show never, never was, um, that you, you literally had to like, uh, uh, like get a breath at some point. And the, and the writers weren't giving you a chance for that. Um, if you thought, if you thought you were done with Optimus Prime's death, well, nope, now he's dead. now they're coming after Earth, or now you're on the drunk planet, now you're this, and, and, and the enemies just get even creepier and weirder, the Quintessons make their... Of appearance and, and you're just like oh they're not gonna even let me have like uh aesthetic niceties they're, they're, they're gonna push my sense of like what this universe is like way out way out there compared to compared to what it was and i've always i've always wondered from that like the the at the same time this movie is being made this is if i'm correct this is an entirely american production while the show is still being filmed in japan is that is that correct uh I think it was all made in the U.S. The artists, there were a lot of uh, Korean. Uh, I think Nelson Shin is like South Korean or something. There's a lot of Korean yeah. and like Asian artists doing the, you know, the the backgrounds and the animation. But I think it was all done here. Yeah. So it it, it was such. So it definitely was going to be disjointed from the TV series, which didn't even make it in its entirety over to be aired in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I remember we got to that point. We all got to that point in the '80s where we're buying, still buying the toys, but that's not what's on the TV anymore. And we're like, well. What does this one do? Why? Why is he important? You know, great transforms into a city. I've never seen this city before. I literally complained about not wanting a transformer because they weren't on TV and I didn't know who they were. That's the kind of kid I was. Um, but uh, this this was just something that stands out as both, I think, honest to parts of the aesthetic of Transformers in the story, but really stands on its own. Um, and I don't think they ever did anything like it since. I, I think they've been afraid to. Yeah. Well, you know, so to that point, um, you know, the, the advantage of having uh, an 11 year old who's into all the same things you are, um, you know, uh, Grayson has now gotten me into watching uh, Transformers, uh, the Netflix show War for Cybertron. 
And that show is dark. Um, And for anyone who, you know, wants to dip a toe back into uh, the Transformers uh, animated universe, I mean... Autobots just get killed. It, it's it's almost Shakespearean in in the level of 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 just macabre uh, that the show is willing to go. And I'm like, what is going on? And I don't think you could have had a show like you know uh, War for Cybertron unless you had the Transformers the movie. Good job, Jack. No, you're the one who, who who pointed that out to me, and and even now Grayson will come to you and he he will say correctly the Transformers the movie, not to be confused with Transformers Michael Bay. You have, you have parented correctly. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so Jack, I have a question for you then. So sure. so so you have some, who's watching this? I randomly caught what I think is the newest show for Transformers, uh, mm-hmm. Earth Spark, because uh-huh. that's on Paramount. Um, okay. So Paramount Plus is is, is airing that. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if Netflix has different rights for a different show. I mean, these things are always moving around. So I was watching a Star Trek show. I think it was Prodigy, which I enjoyed for what it was. And then this came on next, but it's sort of the same genre. And you said dark and I'm like, wow, their newest Transformers is completely the opposite of dark. Um, it's Mm. not cheery, but it's, it's like, uh, I don't know how to, how to put it. It's, it's this sort of like optimistic view of the challenges of, the the aftermath of the great war and, and and the way they sort of tell the story in that i imagine refers to an alternate series of events instead of the movie because it definitely doesn't parallel the movie mm. um where megatron basically at the end is like all right we are wiping each other out optimus prime destroyed the bridge wormhole to cybertron we're all stuck here on earth now so what do we do and he basically surrenders and pledges himself loyalty to the autobots and and turns in most of the Decepticons if they won't repent, uh, and works with an Earth human agency uh, uh, to keep the peace uh, with the now refugee robots, uh, uh, Transformers on Earth. And it's about these families, these very like this very like healthy family that's totally cool with their kids going off into really dangerous situations with Transformers. <laughs> um, and it's like, well, you know, you 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 delayed telling us about this that you were experiencing, but you know. You were very good about this. It was like this healthy parenting lesson. I'm like, this isn't like what I think of as modern Transformers. It's not that dark, but actually for a little kid, it's probably a very healthy show to watch and a lot of fun, but just radically different. And I'm like, Megatron's not supposed to be on the good side. But here we here we are, you know, completely different uh, 30 years later. But now now I want to see what that Netflix show is all about. Because for me, Transformers is, 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 is traumatizing. No, well, I mean... So for, for those of you who haven't watched it, I will not give any spoilers, but I mean, it, it takes, it's, I guess, the equivalent uh, to just kind of jump from, from one property to the next. It is uh, essentially the Rogue One of the Transformers universe. It, it is that level of realistic, uh, obviously it's still animated, um, but it looks at the true horrors of war on Cybertron, what decisions and choices uh, Optimus Prime had to make, uh, what kind of monster, and yet still, because no one ever considers themselves, you know, the the, the villain in in, in their own narrative, and Megatron's kind of warped view of what he's actually trying to do. Um, And so, obviously, it's animated, obviously, they're living robots, but it almost gives you a glimpse into the the dysfunction of of the world today, and it, it's it's almost kind of like, hey, this this is from someone else's perspective. This is what you guys look like. I will have to check that out. That sounds really cool, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Dark, dark. dark. It's yeah. good. It's also a it's like a three parter. So, but yes. now everything is out, so you can actually see them all. Um, I was unfortunately patiently awaiting the last season because um, it it does what I always hoped like things with rich universes would do, which is like pick a small part and explore that, uh, you know, intently, uh, Star Trek Mm -hmm. should be doing more of that probably, but, um, it was nice to see a Transformers show actually dive into Cybertron, which I thought was always like a gold mine that they never really did anything with. So is this Mm -hmm. show, um, Keith or, or Jack, like, is this, is this in continuity? Like, I guess Transformers continuity is all broken at this point, but is this show in continuity with the original generation one, or is it just like an alternate timeline? (laughs) I mean, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, since, it, like, like Keith said, it's a trilogy. Since 
the first two thirds of the trilogy actually happen on Cybertron or leaving Cybertron, it is quite plausible this is what happened before um, the first episode or the first comic book of the Generation One uh, actually occurred. Uh, and so it really just kind of gives you a sense of like, well, everyone always talks about the war in Cybertron. Well, what did that actually look like? I mean, it, it mm-hmm. was vicious. I haven't seen season three yet. I'm only on season two now. Um, but uh, it just watching that part of it, you can at least start to create, it fills in some of the gaps for like what your headcanon has probably been uh, kind of uh, putting forward uh, all of these years. Wow, I'll have to check this out. Like uh, you were you were not wrong, Jack, with your Voltron recommendation on Netflix, so I'll have to check this out too. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I can't take credit, you know, 11 year olds, <laughs> you know, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> Voltron forever. Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think I was jealous of people with your name growing up as a kid because that meant you must be the leader of Voltron. Uh, like that, That's how insanely influential these shows are on a child's mind. Yeah. yeah, I never had to worry about that. I got Orco all, all through the 80s, so you can imagine how happy I was. Yeah, you know. That's rock, I, man. I'm, I'm just gonna. Ref- I'm just gonna. I'm gonna refrain from even with my name. Even yeah. Let's not. Let's not relive that trauma. Well, Keith, before we were jump, we jumped on. Also, we were talking about. I liked your comparison. So going back to like the Optimus Prime's death, obviously in Generation One, he comes back. So I liked your analogy of who you, who you said we had Optimus Prime before we jumped on on the on the podcast. Oh God, what did I say about Optimus Prime? Oh wait, I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it was a very, it felt like a very Spock like moment. I think he even uses, uh, you know, he says, do not grieve, which is pretty close to what Spock says, um, to Kirk. But yeah, that's, that's your, you know, one of your pillar characters of the show and you're doing away with him and it's traumatic for everyone and you don't realize how bad the backlash is going to be. So then you have to string together, um, five phases of darkness and whatever else happened, um, and bring him back as like a, a scary zombie person. But, uh. Yeah, it's 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 a lot to deal with as a kid. I mean, I don't think they knew what they were in for when they threw that script down and decided to film it. Does he actually? He actually does come back though, right? At the end, by the end of the cartoon. Yes, yeah, they, they, they do bring him back. Like he's, I know because yes. I remember that. I think Keith, you, I, I, you might have shown me that too. The five, the zombie um, Optimus Prime for a while, but I know he eventually <laughs> gets restored properly, right? You know, he well. does. He does, and that was the first time like I was. Uh, mastering the use of a VCR for recording things I wanted to like watch later. So I had taped over something that my parents wanted to watch um, <laughs> when recording the multi-part episode for the return of Optimus Prime, because that was also the hate plague. Yes. Uh, uh, exactly. episode. Uh, 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 I think it was a two-parter, uh, maybe three-parter. Um, and that was like, I can rewatch this. I can, I can actually not have to be sitting in front of the TV, uh, uh, you know, because I had to go out and do something outside the house, God forbid. And I was able to come back and watch that episode. And it was really satisfying to see Optimus come back. It was actually a pretty cool way of him coming back, all things considered. Uh, it certainly didn't quite have the darkness of the movie, but it dealt with like the hate plague, the idea of, you know, uh, of, of, of Optimus, you know, bringing back a certain optimism if you will um so i appreciated that as a kid and now i'm trying to figure out in my own memory did i actually watch the movie before or after that because that was like in 87 and i don't i didn't see the movie when it came out i saw it a year or so later and now i wonder what you know what was the actual order order of that because i i remember being vaguely confused as to why optimus wasn't there anymore uh, for for a while, I just knew that he had died, but didn't but hadn't seen hadn't seen the movie. So this is very satisfying uh, to see that come back. But for for a kid to like lose that at that point, I th- I think it's an interesting. Somebody needs to do some sort of like random psychology PhD study on the impact the Transformers the movie had uh, on a generation of kids. Oh but- man, I, I could have done that for like a master's thesis a few years ago in college, <laughs> right? <laughs> they actually suggested that in the commentary. The teacher would probably give me an A just for like being so ballsy as to do such a thing. <laughs> well, I, Optimus, I guess, is the only person who comes back because out of the list of the fallen in this movie, we have Brawn, Prowl, Ratchet, Ironhide, 
wind charger. And, and that's, that's just in the first 10 minutes. And wheel jack. Yeah. And somehow, yeah, yeah, yeah. and somehow, can someone like, can someone also say how all these people die, but Perceptor survives? Like, why is Perceptor surviving? Uh, so, so interesting, interesting thing about Perceptor. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, the toys that made us, God. season two, episode two, uh, was on the Transformers. Now, the actual kind of uh, creator uh, of, of the Transformers or many of the, the Transformer models, Perceptor was his favorite favorite transformer uh-huh. um and so i think in many ways that's just kind of an homage to the uh the father of all of the transformers and so that's why he survived i see because i was like mm-hmm. the guy who turns into a microscope survives and wheeljack and ironhide <laughs> are dead um so <laughs> you know but but how about this how about the, as i'm watching the other day i i am thinking to myself what kind of like lasers are they using in this movie that they haven't used for the last two seasons of the show because they used to just bounce off of everybody like rubber bullets and now they're like cutting through them like swiss cheese and you know their their energy burning up from the inside i'm like why the hell didn't they do this before well arco they're using the the curved lasers i mean they show in that one <laughs> shot and they're one's purple and one is orange i mean we're all over the place here it, clearly they were they had stormtroopers kind of uh, um <laughs> artillery up in, in season one and two but during the movie man they they were right on target i mean we don't really talk about i mean guess transitioning into the deaths of of characters i mean megatron doesn't really die but who else do we lose and in, just the insecticons i mean it's not really clear what which decepticons get demolished in a fight either well they they you, you have a doesn't uh some of the airplanes too oh some of the airplanes, the, the airplanes yeah. die but they, yes their stories is, is a completely different trajectory because they're meant to be you know the ones who come back, so even the ones who die, most of them are remade by Unicron. Yeah, uh, not just right. not just Megatron and the Galvatron. And that was right. sort of the uh, the shocking point was that wait, the bad guys not only don't suffer the same consequences, but they sort of get upgrades. Yeah, um, yeah. they 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 become the sweeps, and they were uh, mm-hmm. Galvatron's like a uh, little army and everything. Mm-hmm. So, which and I thought that Galvatron looked fantastic as. Uh, as a, as a design, um, I'm not sure about the sweeps the, uh, per se, but uh, as far they as they look like you know, hovercrafts, yeah, yeah, they didn't look they didn't look that fantastic to me. But he looked he looked great. I mean, he was always you know t- to me, uh, Megatron is always going to be a gun. So yeah. uh, I don't care I don't care what the hell uh, Bay says during his five terrible films. Well, I feel like Galvatron was a necessary change because. He- Every time Megatron transforms into his most powerful form of a gun, like he has to jump into the arms of his primary rival, uh, Starscream. I mean, that's just right, the most right. ridiculous thing in the world. And they didn't do. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't remember him actually doing that in this particular in this film. All of a sudden, though, his uh, arm cannon is is, is yeah. blowing is blowing Autobots' heads off. You know, right? <laughs> so, I mean, where was that power the last two seasons? So, I will say in the. Um... The War for Cybertron trilogy, uh, Megatron is not a gun. Uh, I don't want to ruin what he is, um, but uh, I, I guess the the whole mass differential was just too much for for people uh, of today to accept. Yes, well, the U.S. We love our guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot in Masco. <laughs> you can go off a really interesting tangent about that. Because you think of you think of this show both in its more peaceable form, where the lasers bounce off people, and the movie where people are brutally killed by the laser guns and cannons, um, and the nature of today, where it's very much like, uh, uh, okay, well, we don't want to necessarily depict a gun in an animated show anymore, uh, but the culture at large seems to have a lot more problem with violence, and I'm like, what's what's the weird inflection there of how we grew up with with a cartoon that was. Uh, 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 demonstrably very violent, uh, particularly in his movie form, uh, um, uh, compared to some of the watered down things we sort of see today. While I feel like today's cartoons are thematically more mature than what we would watch, um, they're 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 a little bit less uh, uh, violent, and that's just such a weird thing that I feel like compares us to the '80s as well. Now the '80s is a more visceral, uh, uh, sort of dirtier violent time but things just also seem to sort of work out you know overall i don't know maybe maybe that's just the way you think of like as a kid going through the 80s whereas now it's like well things look pretty nice but man everything's falling apart (laughs) 
and maybe and maybe that's the journey of of, of cartoons for 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 our lifetimes. Yeah. Well, Keith, what were you gonna say there? Uh, I was gonna say there's not much hand holding in this movie. I mean, it's pretty much, hey kids, uh, you do you like these characters? Have toys of them and look up to them. Well, that's cool. We're gonna have Megatron come into the shuttle and murder everyone with gun violence, and then uh, we'll just let you deal with it. And doing it while yeah. over an '80s rock ballad. So. Uh, yep, a... <laughs> we're gonna pump that up to eleven in the background. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we haven't gotten nearly as much into that because that is that is the pinnacle of what this movie is about is is having this insane extra score. I mean, I, again, going th- living to the 80s, you don't get to see in retrospect just how hilariously out there and amazing glam rock and heavy metal really are. Um, I, uh, you know. I I live I live that uh, sentence every day of my life. Thank you. Just so you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. every, <laughs> every single day. <laughs> like I just look back and I'm like, wait. So it wasn't. I always think like, oh, is that like a white lion or a white snake? No, it was just lion. It was just oh, lion. Oh, I just saw, lion. saw that myself. I'm like, who sings <laughs> this? I'm like, who the hell is lion? And they, they have, I, people, I have to be honest with you. I don't know or uh, any of I these mean, bands. Instruments of Destruction is NRG. A Wikipedia page. They're sprinkled from all those other bands we just mentioned. It's I, like I don't know who crazy. Stan Bush is. I don't know who Stan Bush is. I I am a hair metal guy through and through. Stuff. I, but I, I'm sorry. I don't know who Stan Bush is. <laughs> I don't know. He was in a band called Boulder. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to hear that he was somebody. He was nobody. He was nobody. Well, I, I would like to say that, however, Boulder. Stan Bush. He, yeah, As of this I, I, year, I, worth five million dollars. Yeah. So he did something right. <laughs> I, I, that's right. That's right. I honestly, I believe that he's a he's the poor man Sammy Hagar because Sammy <laughs> Hagar singing the touch would have brought it all down. <laughs> well, didn't Stan? I mean, Stan Bush had a. I mean, Stan Bush did the movie, the music for the Rocky movies too. And wasn't did he do some of the Tom Cruise movies at the time? Was also did he do any of the stuff? What the that? He did. He did. A, he did that. I don't, I don't know. really. Stan Bush is actually the poor man's Frank Stallone. So, uh, okay, that's true. That's true. <laughs> he did some stuff for Kickboxer. Yeah, it looks like Bloodsport. Oh, Bloodsport. Yeah, okay, okay. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, I don't see anything of that, James. I'm sorry. Oh wait, no. You know what I'm thinking of? Vince DiCola did the uh, score for Rocky IV. Ah. Sorry, Vince DiCola. Vince DiCola. Wasn't that the guy from Survivor? Is that the, is that where Vince DiCola is from? I, I don't know. I I I, I believe I believe so. Uh, Question mark. I don't, but it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Stan Bush. Don't know. Well, I like this. I like this music for. I mean, listen. Is you know, I guess those eighty power ballads might seem out of place, but since I whenever I just accept the movie as it is, so I'm like, this fits. This fits with all the crazies. Yeah, and absolutely. Chaos. Oh no, it, it definitely <laughs> fits. It's just because because of the insanity going on, and for those of us live, who who live through the '80s or may have watched it, at, you know, back in '86. When I watched it in the '90s, and it was the early '90s, so I was still, uh, I still had my mullet because uh, I was awesome. And uh, you know, looking back on it, you, you listen to the music; it definitely fit. But the whole movie was insane. Yes, well, that's true. Well, this goes to another point I wanted to bring up, and I, um, I think Keith, I started asking about this prior to the mics going hot, but Ultra Magnus and is like the that's the first time we see Ultra Magnus, right? Like this is this is he wasn't at the end of Generation One or Season Two or anything. This is the first time we meet Ultra Magnus. As far it's been a while, but as far as I'm aware, um, yes, I, I, like him, Springer, um, RC. I don't think they were in the show before that. And this yeah. is this is the guy that Optimus Prime gives the Matrix of Leadership to, like just. Well, I mean, we all make bad choices. Okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like, he's like, why won't this open? Yeah, he's like, yeah. I mean, it's rough. Even even the um, even in the uh, when they were talking uh, through the commentary, they, you know, they put that in there on purpose. Like obviously, where Rodimus, uh, Hot Rod, it falls, he catches it, he has his shining moment with the Matrix. But then also when. Ultra Magnus puts it in and, you know, it, it doesn't quite fit and he has to adjust it. And you're like, oh, this guy doesn't have it. Whatever it is, he doesn't have it. <laughs> he doesn't have fingers for the finger holes, apparently. Yeah, that too. That's, yeah. <laughs> but also, like, he's trying to open up the Matrix. Like, I don't know if this, that's their darkest moment, the time Ultra Magnus tries to open up the Matrix. It's just, you know, listen, I understand Ultra Magnus. Um, I understand why they did it, probably, just to make Ultra Magnus a nice toy that you want to buy and almost the leader. But 
yeah, I, I, you know, Prime, Prime's judgment was not great. He was also dying and blown to pieces. So I, we can just <laughs> we can lay all that on on that the fact that he's just delirious from almost dying. But um, it's a sen- senior moment for him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess it was, you know, not necessarily. I mean, there were no trials or, or anything like that. It was just he was the next in line. I mean, so yes. I mean, oh, that's... not much simpler than that. He was a truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is indeed true. Who's got room for you know the Matrix? What? Okay, you, you get know, it. I, you know what, John? You are 100% correct because Hot Rod, a.k.a. Rodimus Prime, in his mm-hmm. new form, had to bulk up significantly because that's the only <laughs> way you can be a leader. But at the very least, you got to look like an 80s RV. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that what he was? <laughs> is that what Hot Rod was? I have no idea. What, what kind of car was he? I think he was pretty much supposed to be, yeah, like a fancy RV. I mean, it makes sense in the '80s. You want to be a leader, you got to take steroids. So he can't just be a small, skinny guy. You gotta, you gotta bulk up. Oh boy. Oh. Well, I like that the Matrix power is it can transform the the chosen one into whatever form they they need to be to order to be the leader of the Autobots. So that was like a you know a nice transformational form. It goes from a hot rod to a to a very slick looking RV back in the '80s at the end there. Hey, they knew their market. Everybody wanted an RV in the 80s. You know, yes. That, 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 that was the thing. They, the mark, marketing is still what this movie is all about. Oh. Uh, now, they may not entirely realize what they're marketing at a given point, but the, it, it, it was so much of it. And somebody brought up earlier Hasbro, which is a, a name and infamy for me right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, 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 it boggles my mind, like looking back at these things, how specifically 80s they are. Um, because it's not just the music; it's, it's the RV, it's the aesthetic, the boombox. Yeah, yeah, the boombox. Oh my the god! Sound wave. Everything and the family dynamics are like it's like from an eight, even the family dynamics in the middle of like the robot apocalypse happening in the movie. It feels like an eighties sitcom, nonetheless. Yes. Yeah, Sus- Susan Blue, uh, even in the when she was you know doing the commentary, she. She brought up the moment where um, RC has, you know, Daniel on her shoulder and she's like, oh, RC has such a motherly instinct. It's nice that they were able to show that. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, I guess, quote unquote, traditional uh, values, even for female robots. Which, again, is an idea that logically makes no sense. But no, none of it I digress. <laughs> I'm not sure we were thinking about sense when we were watching this. No, right, they, exactly. They specifically say that like they didn't try to make sense. Like uh, the sizes of the transformers, uh, Flint Dilly's like, look, when it was convenient to have someone be ginormous and have them next to a human, we did that. When everyone was in Astro Train, they just got smaller, and we don't know how that yeah, happened. And like Astrotrain. we thought about uh, <laughs> what to do with uh, Optimus's trailer, and we came up with, you know what? We don't care. It's just going to disappear. It's made of like you know. Uh, Disappearium or whatever uh, Cybertronian element you want to call it, and it just goes away. When <laughs> it doesn't need it. The the, th- the thing about that, Keith, is that things like that led to countless oh, it's great late night discussions with all of us about that kind of minutia. And thinking back on it, I'm like, is that who I've always been? And then I realized, yes, even John. to this day, yes, we will yes. still <laughs> argue about the most pointless minutia of things that make absolutely no sense and never will. That's what makes it great, though. I wonder uh, that Transformers brings out of all of us and brings us together. Well, the Cybertronians must have also discovered what the Gallifreyans discovered about things being bigger on the inside. So that's how they just you know, <laughs> figured that <laughs> all out. That. <laughs> yeah. So. Has there ever been a comic book Doctor Who Transformers crossover? I wouldn't surprise oh, well, me. You know what? That is an idea whose time has come. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Hasbro being Hasbro, they, they they will never come to terms with the BBC. No. Oh no! Even though uh, Gal- Megatron regenerates into Galvatron, which is another um, Galifrenian, yeah. he must have looked into the eye of the, yes, of the TARDIS right. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> or Unicron has the eye of the TARDIS with inside of him, so we can do that. Seeing again, seeing like the fact that I saw this movie like when I was older and just accepted it on face value for what it was. Like when you like, like Keith and John, when you guys saw it when you were younger, what what is your impression of Unicron? Was it like a trope or was it impressive? Or how did how did you guys feel about Unicron as a villain? Uh, John, you you go first. Well, you, you, Unicron was suitably scary as a villain for this because you know it, 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 he was bigger than life, uh, quite literally. And I'll get to the other aspect of that in a second. Uh, I the voice. Uh, but Unicron was terrifying because it was devouring 
Cybertron? How is that even possible? Because that's like the basis of every, what everybody's been fighting over. So yeah, seeing him consume planets uh, that nobody can touch Unicron, uh, that he's fully conscious and has this like, you know, deep, resonating, terrifying voice uh, really worked out well. And a whole like factory inside where Autobots were hard, though, actually all the uh, Transformers were just like being horribly melted down. Very, very scary. I think a suitably uh, a, a epic villain for a movie like this. Uh, I did not know at the time the significance of that voice, which, you know, there, there, there's the elephant in the room we haven't discussed is oh, Orson Welles. I, I was right. waiting. I was waiting <laughs> to talk about that. But go ahead. Like, <laughs> here we are, Orson Welles. And, and, and just to contextualize all of this, um, he began his career with a little known movie, Citizen Kane, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is it. This is um, his last movie. Guy is in the middle of song. recording. The this man was movie. talking as he was talking in this film. As he was recording, you, every breath you, you, you heard, he was you, you heard him going for oxygen on every line, and knowing that he died literally five days after he finished recording this. Yeah, it just goes to show you that the man was I, I, was dying on every line of this. Like something has happened. Like maybe broke him on the inside. Like I started with Citizen and, Kane, and I and I'm ending with this. <laughs> oh, like you, you, you wonder, you wonder, you're just like, oh, is this what did it? Is this what pushed him over the edge? Well, they said uh, they then, software augmented his voice to make it stronger. And I was just thinking, like, if this is his voice stronger, dear God, the man was on in the deathbed. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, he, yeah. He, he really was dying. And honestly, I, I bet you he thought that um, his the absolute depths must have been during the Muppet movie back in 1979. But no, hold my beer because we got the Transformers movie. Hey, what about that campaign commercial? That was that. That, that may have also been it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, he was doing it for the money at that point, man. <laughs> but you think like all the rumors that went around about that, like d- did he yeah. finish filming it? Uh, Leonard Nimoy having to step in for some of the, uh, you know, uh, yeah. ADR and, 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 and voiceovers for that. And then of course there we all were watching it, you know, a little at, at that point in our late teens and early twenties um, uh, being complete douchebags about it, being like, well, that's him dying. as Unicron explodes. That was his last breath. Like that was sensitive clearly. Pretty much uh, was. <laughs> but now, <laughs> when you really do think about it, it may have been the end of his will. I mean, it's. I'd like to think that in in the right frame of mind, he sees a certain, he saw a certain uh, poetic beauty to ending on Transformers. In reality, I just sort of... I mean, you, you probably think also, like, aside from just doing the work at that, wanting, uh, needing the work or doing the work for whatever reason he did it, I mean... Maybe he was thinking about just being trying to be relevant with you know the younger generation. I mean, that's usually what movie stars are trying to do is just keep themselves relevant. So, or I somebody mean, just told him it was Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. Um, Keith, what did you think of uh, Unicron as a villain? Um, they were actually well. Just to go back in time a little bit, uh, they were talking about uh, obviously Orson Welles in the commentary, and they said um, they were all deathly afraid of him because they were, I mean, for the most part, in their twenties and thirties. So they knew this screen legend was coming in and for whatever reason he was going to film lines for the movie. And uh, apparently he absolutely lambasted one of the the sound people, like I guess like a helper person. And he just went off on him and they're like, oh, my God, like, you know, this guy's going to be a diva. He's just going to be here to cash his paycheck and he's going to want to get out. But they said he was super nice and uh, very excited to do it. I don't know if they were lying just because it was the commentary. It's certainly possible. But um. It, it would be nice to think that Orson Welles was psyched about doing something a little outside of his comfort zone, maybe. And also get it. I didn't, I mean, the Unicron as a villain, uh, yeah, he was uh, just awesome. I mean, the biggest Transformer up until that point that I had experience with was probably Omega Supreme. And it was like, he's so big and so powerful that um, we're under attack and the Decepticons might kill us all. But, you know, we're not going to call Omega Supreme because he's, he's our last uh, line of defense. <laughs> It's like, all right, cool, but when are you going to call Omega Supreme? Um, um, but yeah, but then yeah, Unicron absolutely dwarfs, uh, obviously, Omega Supreme. I mean, he right. goes, he's like twice the size of all the planets he interacts with, basically. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, unfathomable. And the amount of death and destruction, like, yeah, I, going back to like just the darkness of the movie, I, I'd forgotten even like the planets he crushes up everyone's digested with inside of them and uses his powers or is that's that's pretty bleak too john i mean yep. you brought you that's very very bleak he's got to eat man he's yeah. an energy vampire <laughs> he's got to hit his macros for the day 
<laughs> I guess he doesn't care because he was almost unless uh, Daniel had, had stepped in there, he was going to digest Spike as well. So I guess he, you know, it organic or matter. inorganic matter, matter. He's, he's going to eat it. Machine powered by blood. Nothing, uh, <laughs> nothing worse than that. <laughs> Argos, you, you know, you seeing it later in life. What was your thoughts on on the villain Unicron? Oh, um, well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. You know, when I heard about the film in the 80s, I had no idea who Orson Welles was. However, when I was 18, 19, yes, I knew who he was. And it was kind of a big deal that this guy was doing this. Um, but as far as the design of the character, it was, looking back on it, it was it was done very well. It's spot on and truly you know, terrifying to any six-year-old kid watching it. I'm sure it was, you know, going out of their minds watching this huge freaking thing come out of space. You know, um, I, I, I found it amazing, though, that they never put out a toy for it. I know that there was uh, pictures of, uh, of uh, prototypes and everything, but they, as far as I know, they never put out a toy for, uh, for the biggest thing in, in Transformers history. I, I mean, it doesn't have to be that big, obviously, but something uh, small scale would have been nice. And uh, but uh, I, I thought I thought it was perfect to have him sound the way he did. And it was he sounded menacing, it, it, like a like a dying Darth Vader, you know, as far for for reference. Yeah, I thought I thought when I first saw it, it was a pretty, pretty cool design and pretty good threat for the uh, Transformers. Again, like again, seeing the, tra- the movie about when, you know, you saw it, Arco, age wise. But um, Jack, what were your thoughts on Unicron? So, I mean, again, I think Unicron was, uh, you know, and everything that we said with respect to, you know, the 80s and the time, I mean, it it's the only logical thing they could have done. Uh, I mean, you 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 have this this uh, rivalry between Megatron and Prime and, you know, everybody's been watching that for for kind of two seasons. Um, and, and so what do you what do you do in the movie? You, you just go bigger, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Megatron quote unquote, dies. Uh, and then there is, you know, something even more menacing than Megatron. And and it's the size of a planet. Uh, and again, I, we've already discussed with, that's just essentially uh, consuming all of everything for, for nutrients. And so um, it, it's, it's almost mythic uh, in, in, in its, its, its scale and proportion. And so um, if you're going to go big, that's, that's where you go. Uh, again, we can sit back and scientifically discuss the whole notion of the gravity of, you know, what that would mean to earth and all of that. We're having fun. I mean, so uh, why are we in a good time? We're not going to start getting into the laws of That's physics. Funny. Now. Yeah. <laughs> the laws of oh, physics boy. now, Jack. <laughs> I can only imagine the college nights in the late eighties, <laughs> early nineties, you know, during, during um, midterms and everybody's, <laughs> Totally oh. like just cracked out because they're so tired and they're talking about Transformer movie. My yeah, God, but, what, a, what a time to be alive! <laughs> I'm, I'm sure even Carl Sagan himself was actually sitting back and doing the math and saying, "Well, there's actually no reason for 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 Galvatron <laughs> to go back. Yeah, you know, just having a, a Unicron right there is enough to destroy the planet. I, I think you're done." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Well, Arca, just to answer your point, they did not release one for the original toy line, but they, I guess, HasLab in the last few years for the war for yeah, Cybertron figures did, did a oh, Unicron okay, figure okay. that is uh, currently on okay. eBay for $3,000. And he's, uh, I don't know how big he is, but um, he must be pretty big. So Okay. Um, yeah, all right, all right. So covering Unicron, uh, we touched on him already, but um, but uh, Galvatron, um, I think, was, a, like I said, Arco, a cool design. I don't know how much Galvatron held up after, you know, Transformers the movie because, um, but I thought he was a cool villain, at least from my perspective. I didn't have the same attachment to Megatron, but was that a big shift to go from Galvatron, I mean, from Megatron to Unicron for anybody? I mean, sorry, Unicron, Galvatron rather. Well, they dumped the poor guy into uh, a pool of lava and let him uh, stew with his pain circuits on too. So like, if you thought your villain wasn't crazy enough, uh, don't worry. They they took that to eleven also in the uh, in the series afterwards after the movie. I forgot about that. I do now that you bring that up. I remember that because they, they never show that in the movie where he winds up. But that that that's right. It's where he no. ends up in a lava pit, right? Wow. Yeah, when uh, Erotimus throws him through Unicron, apparently he lands in a lava, basically a lava pool, and his pain circuits are stuck on. So he's a little bit special after that. 
<laughs> At least now I, we know I, where I, Lucas got that. the idea. So yeah. <laughs> right, uh, that's 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 wow. I I'd forgotten about that. Well, Galvatron, I guess, disappears after they were done with the Generation One cartoon, right? Because did they brought Galvatron back in any of the incarnations of the of Transformers? Oh yeah, I thought oh, yeah. they did. Yeah. The season oh, yeah. after was, the movie he comes back. Replacement stand. He, I mean, he he was the main villain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, was, he just came back, and I I remember some seconds, or I guess it was second or third season episodes where the show did take on a distinctly darker feel. Uh, but again, it wasn't, it, it, it was sort of shoehorned in because it wasn't being produced entirely, you know, he, you know, here we were sort of, you know, dealing, you know, dealing with the show that Oregon made uh, elsewhere. And, uh, uh, and they were coming off the movie as well, but it was, it, it got creepy as hell. Uh, <laughs> there was an episode where uh, mostly the bad guys, but then everybody got like infected with something and there were like these like robot pustules on them uh, that like would like well yeah. up and, and, and look. And it was just gross. And I'm thinking as a kid, I'm like, oh, this is horrifying. Um, what's happening to my robots? Um, so that and, and I feel like that's that's when you really start seeing the more of the 80s nature come out of that. What I mean by that is the, the 80s were big on body horror. Uh, uh, gross out horror, things happening that are disgusting and horrific to the human body. That's a big part of horror, slasher, and and, and, and thriller films of the 1980s in particular. I think in part because the special effects uh, lent themselves to that for the first time, uh, uh, you know, coming out of the 70s into the 80s. But that's really what the 80s are known for in terms of the way that horror is portrayed is body horror. To see that make its way even into your cartoons is like, yeah, we're not getting away from this uh, e even here. Um, so that's why I found that that later season where they're exploring outside of Cybertron um, and, and into the galaxy, uh, sometimes unsettling for a still, you know, eight ish, whatever year old I was, you know, um, uh, whereas other ca cartoons were sort of sticking with uh, sticking with a script, everything from Voltron, He-Man, even G.I. Joe was still, you know, relatively sticking with it, though G.I. Joe got into it too with it with a movie in the post movie and what happened to Cobra commander and the weird deformities they showed in him as he was mutating into and out of a snake and everything else, uh, which, uh, we don't, that movie was a fever dream. Oh my gosh. You could do like three hours on a GI Joe movie. Uh, yeah, I, that, that movie was, they, they were, they were, it came, it, you said it went right to uh, video. It, uh, it came with yeah. its own little acid pack for you to watch along. I, I watch the intro and, every once in a while and then I turn it right off. I saw, <laughs> I saw it's a little, little bump yeah, of cocaine. <laughs> I saw, I saw it in, in 87 and, and, it was on television, so it wasn't like I had to rent it or anything, but um, I, I, I forgot what the hell it was on. And I'm watching this, and I remember that snake staff go through uh, Duke. It was yes. Duke. Yeah, it went through Duke. And, and I'm like, oh, he's, 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 and they're supposed to kill him, and then obviously they bring him back. But yeah, they, they, they go to uh, Cobra Law, and these guys are turning into snakes. And Cobra. oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Take me back. <laughs> I always felt like, you know, going back to that era, we had the after school specials. There was Helen Hunt on PCP throwing herself out of a window. I'm like, no, there were no drugs involved in that. She just watched G.I. Joe. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're right. We could do a three hour show on G.I. Joe. Just the insanity from that. From that movie, and and amazingly, amazingly, it because they killed off uh, Optimus Prime and so many of the Autobots, and and killed so many uh, children's uh, happiness that they decided to not put that movie out, and they took a loss on that also. And uh, it's just amazing that and and all they did they they changed the one thing that uh, Duke was going to live at the end. I that 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 film is crazy because you know. It's, it's it's, it's made through a heart. It's just a flesh wound. So. The toys went on longer than Transformers, though. I think Transformers has now had more cultural longevity and more incarnations. Uh, in terms of, I think, pure sales, G.I. Joe went into the 90s uh, very well, strong. I, for very, very, I agree. I agree. And, I mean, of course, in G.I. Joe, obviously, was around in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. as uh, with a kung fu grip and everything, and they were like... <laughs> 12 inch toys and everything, you know? So, but I mean, you know, let, let's talk about the toys for a second. I mean, even though I was 12 at the time, I, the, the Christmas right before that for uh, of the winter of uh, 1985, I got my very, I think my very first and only Transformer toy. And I don't want to make anybody jealous, but I got Jetfire. 
and it was Ooh. it was exactly it was exactly that and i only the wish transformer that I, that's not really a transformer exactly exactly it's actually it's, a, a valkyrie from macross macross yeah, right? yeah. yeah yeah there's a there's a story behind that and but i did get that that uh, that jet fire and it was awesome <laughs> it was great. <laughs> well, speaking of the toys, well, actually, just go back for a second. Keith and Jack, I know you, we were all excited to jump in, but you both looked like you were going to say something about uh, for a moment there. So what were you, what were you guys going to say? Or Keith, what were you going to say? And then Jack. Uh, I was just going to say that they touched on that in the commentary a little bit with the G.I. Joe, what happened with G.I. Joe. Basically, um, Transformers came out. I think it was like a five point something or maybe six million dollar budget. And they like didn't even make it back. So I think all their they said basically all their advertisers kind of like freaked out. Um, so they just had to release G.I. Joe to DVD or a DVD to VHS. Um, so, yeah, that's probably why, like, there was a massive uh, like Homer Simpson walk yourself back into the bushes moment. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, you were going right. to jump in, too. What were you going to say? Yeah, so I mean, one of the many YouTube channels that that I frequent uh, had this discussion as to uh, how the whole notion of GI Joe became so disjointed, and I, I think Arco said it best: it's a fever dream. I mean, they literally just came to a place where they said, "All right, well, th- there are no bad ideas," uh, and, and and so um, they they created this whole notion: it's just kind of well, we're just going to clone all of the worst people in history, and and then you're going to come up with you know. Uh, uh, Serpentor, and oh, but wait, there's this ancient secret society of snake worshippers and snake people. Um, I mean, so it was just kind of like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll buy that. You know, I'll buy that for a dollar. Um, and again, it, 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 again, there were no bad ideas. It's just everything was just thrown into the mix. Uh, and uh, I think, to as part of this discussion, I mean, would Transformers have held the same cultural, you know, legacy if not for the Michael Bay movies? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and essentially, wait. I'm sorry. Uh, the what movies? Uh, I, I think <laughs> I, th- I think Grayson told me somebody somewhere did a live action thing. Did they do something I, with with Mutt from 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 the Indiana Jones, but that's also <laughs> being retconned out. I, I don't know. So, so, so people are talking. Um, and you know the the two GI Joe movies. Well, I guess three if you count Snake Eyes. Um, the G.I. Joe movies that exist uh, just never hit that same kind of cultural pulse that yeah. that um, other films based on Hasbro products like Battleship did. So <laughs> uh, they'll chime in now like Chris would like if, uh, if, Chris, <laughs> if Chris were here, he'd be like saying, uh, you know, this is the uh, preview uh, preview for the audience of our G.I. Joe, the movie commentary. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, nice segue. Yeah. So, uh, but Argo, you did bring up a good point about the toys. And since we're talking about Transformers, I, I'm curious, like, um, so, I mean, Keith, did you have, like, like what, what was your Transformer collection like? Um, I had a decent amount. Um, I definitely tended to get more of the, um, I guess, uh, Gestalt characters because they were smaller and cheaper because they had to fit together to make one big robot. So mm. um, I had more of those, but like, I mean, Transformers was the intersection for me of awesome and like, as Johnny Lawrence would say, badassery because uh, <laughs> you had robots, you had a technology, you, you had vehicles. I mean, they transformed into, you had amazing toys. I mean, there, there was nothing better than getting a, a Transformer and, you know, going to watch the show with whatever you had that was cool. However, I did not have a uh, Skyfire, Jetfire, what have you. Um, because I wasn't rich like Arco, so, you know. Hardly rich. <laughs> I, got, I got it as a gift. Hardly rich. Yeah, whatever. You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Guys flying in from Italy. Who knows what's happening? Exactly. Exactly. Jack, let's just, we'll jump to you. What was your, do you have a Transformers collection? Um, yeah, but not, not quite as many. So this, this is the interesting thing. So uh, I definitely had more J. Joe figures than Transformers. Uh, the price point on them were, you know, significantly different. But 
the, the good thing, and I think uh, is we kind of touched on this, they were durable. Uh, I mean, the, the the one thing, particularly with the Generation 1 G.I. Joe figures is, um, you know, you played with it too long, that thumb just snapped right off. Um, and then, sure did. Yeah, and then there was nothing you could do. Um, and, you know, the first generation even didn't have as many points of articulation. They got better as, as, as time went along. Um, but, you know, the Transformers, I had Hound. I had gotten Hound, I think it was for a, a birthday present. Um, and I think I might have had uh, maybe Bumblebee or one of the smaller figures. Um, and the thing I always loved most about the Transformers, as far as figures are concerned, is when you compared them to uh, the G.I. Joe figures, they're just a lot more durable. So, I mean, the, the playtime, I think, was exponentially better. You, I mean... You have a robot and you have a vehicle. Uh, and uh, the craftsmanship and the articulation was just, I think, you know, far and away uh, a, lot, a lot more fun than, than G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe had a lot more stuff, but I mean, no kid could could afford like everything that they, they could put out. But there was a, a point, particularly, I think, in the, the 90s where uh, Transformers Hasbro in their infinite quest for the almighty dollar um, would actually have like special Transformers figures that were also based on classic cars and they would just uh, make great gifts. And so uh, they had a Grimlock figure uh, that was actually a Mustang. And so I bought one for my brother for one Christmas and one for uh, my friend Pete because they both like Mustangs and they both like Transformers. And it's just like the perfect gift. That is a perfect gift, Jack. Yeah. I was yeah, just... I, I, I... I'm looking at that now. I want yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I would just say, like, watching the movie, though, in terms of the Autobots they killed, I was like, you're not killing the Dinobots because kids love dinosaurs, is what I was thinking watching it. Like, you can kill every other every other Autobot and Optimus Prime, but you're not killing the dinosaurs because trans robots and dinosaurs, that's like making money right there and then. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that, though, but, you know, they were useless in, in that yeah. film in the beginning. They came out against Construct, uh, Constru uh, the Constructicons and uh, Devastator, and they did zero. And and when did they start flying? Like, all of them. Grimlock could fly? Were they were they falling in style? Or were they... they were falling in style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. It looked like flying to me, but okay. I think they did serve a purpose in the movie, but I, it's funny because I always, I never cared for the Dinobots at all. I, yeah, I was all about vehicles. I wanted to like drive yeah, around and I, like jump ramps and stuff like that. Yeah, but, um, I, I'm the, yeah. I love dinosaurs like every other kid, but let me tell you something. Grimlock was annoying, annoying AF. That's all I got to say. In the movie, I do think they serve a purpose only because, like, they're the comic relief. Like, when they come out, you pretty much are guaranteed that nothing is going to happen bad, which which is a far cry from the entirety of the rest of the movie. So they're like a little bit of breath of fresh air, and then you're back to the killing. <laughs> back, to the, back to the carnage. Back to the woodshed. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Transformer carnage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I gotta, I gotta ask, like, so, you know, growing up, like, you guys, like John and Keith, like you did, did you, like Keith, did you accept Rodimus Prime? Like he, he didn't take Optimus Prime's place, right? No, no one can take uh, Optimus Prime's place. That's, that's, that is heresy right there. <laughs> and John, what Agreed. about, what about you, John? Were you on board with like Rodimus? Literally never. It, it, it was always, even as a kid, I would, I'd just be sitting there in judgment of like, you're not, you're not really in charge. Uh, uh, who do you think you are? And, uh, I, that's where I realized like, oh, oh, you can be completely fake and still be in charge. He's a substitute teacher. <laughs> oh, but he was an RV and he had little flames on that like were very like 80s-esque, but like they didn't pull off like the sheer and the like, pipes. Don't forget, don't forget the pipes. Yes. yes. The pipes <laughs> like, okay, great. Like you're intense. You're probably going off to play in your band after the show. Cool. <laughs> But you're not meant to lead the Autobots. Like you, you're, 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 you're not. You're not. You're not Optimus. Um, and I think that was a. I, I think that's a. Again, some of it could go into your master's thesis, there, Arco. Like. Yeah. Like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right there at the end. That's that's my finishing. You're not Optimus. <laughs> <laughs> what, you know, what is it? Uh, Lloyd Benson. It's just kind of like uh, it's like Optimus Prime was a friend of mine. I knew Optimus Prime and Rodimus. You are no Optimus. You are Optimus Prime. <laughs> <laughs> the defense rests exactly. <laughs> and jack i'm assuming you're in the same boat rodimus was not uh no optimus prime either well you know i, I think i'm a, a little 
more forgiving. And so I think his introduction in the movie was pretty impressive. Um, you know, I, 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 I if, and you know, we, we've all just kind of recently watched a movie where there's the moment where he opens, you know, uh, the, 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 the leadership matrix and, and then you have uh, Prime's voice in the background and then uh, Unicron is going all to hell and then you see Rodimus running and then Cup notices that he's coming down. I think it did good kid. Um, and, and so, I mean, there's- uh, I knew you had it in yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um, th- there's that moment that I was like, okay, that's amazing. And then they completely squandered the, that emotional moment with the show because when the show came back, uh, the Transformers, you know, the year 2005, uh, humans were going into space. It, it just the show he had nothing to do is is fundamentally the problem. Um, and and so he never had another leadership moment. And 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 so it's just, I mean, he 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 was like you know, King Charles, um, you know, it's just kind of like, well, uh, y- 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 <laughs> oh man, I mean, give the guy some a chance. It took him 70 years to get there. Exactly. And, 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 and everybody knew, <laughs> everybody knew either, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth was going to come back or he was just going to, his time would set uh, and then someone else would take, uh, take over. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, there was just, he never had a moment to shine after the movie, and I don't know if that was by design. I don't know if it was due to the backlash. Um, you know, I think we've already discussed that, you know, the return of Optimus Prime. And so at that point, it's just kind of like, I mean, why would you care about him? Well said. Well said. Yes. <laughs> why would Jesus. you care? Were you eulogizing a freaking cartoon character <laughs> and putting him down? Meanwhile, the guy's, the guy's like, I could have been somebody. <laughs> He's. <laughs> Lines of oil because he, nobody loved them. <laughs> yeah, Arco, you, you can put that line in your th- your master's thesis as well. You know, <laughs> why would you care? Thank you. You better cite Jack Adrian, though. <laughs> I certainly will. Uh, well, let's try to like um, just just for fun, putting Optimus Prime aside because he technically died. Who, who were your favorite characters in Transformers the movie? Like, what's your of the new characters we saw, who were some of your favorites? Keith, did you? Who did you like out of what they what they gave you for the next next generation of Transformers, or Decepticons uh, for that matter? So post post movie. Yeah, yeah. Like of, of of the of the of what you got in the movie and post movie, who did you like, or who was your favorite character? <sighs> yeah, that's pretty tough, man. I don't know. There's not a lot. Those um, pickings are slim. <laughs> I I really enjoyed. I- yeah, go go go. No, I'm sorry. Can I just make a point here um, that obviously we know that this movie came out specifically because they needed to kill off the first uh, two seasons of, of characters in order to bring out a new batch of characters to sell toys. But can you tell me any of those characters that we met for the first time in this film or came in uh, after in the in third season that were worth what what the movie did to the, everything else there were no good toys there were no good characters like there there was nobody in this film that could have taken the place of i mean i loved ratchet so i don't know yeah, about you guys absolutely. i mean but that's my point i mean that they, they killed a guy who was a freaking ambulance you know in the first 2 minutes you know and um and, and none of the characters that they brought about whether it be you know maybe galvatron would be the only one that the design really stood out none of the sweeps or any of the Quintessons or or the garbage, you know, uh, robots. Uh, Eric Idle, my God, what was he doing? And um, you know, th- we didn't even talk about him. Yeah, well, the less said, the better, because that was ridiculous. <laughs> but you know, they for what they were trying to do, I think they failed in actually bringing about a new generation of toys uh, and characters to replace the old ones. So the the um, the toys that made us actually discuss is part of this. Um, so for the longest time, Hasbro had this relationship with, with Takara and Takara was basically designing, uh, the Transformers and then basically just repackaging them and sending them to the States. Uh, I think right around the time the movie came out, that relationship uh, had started to kind of dissolve. Uh, and so most of the toys were designed domestically. I think we can all see that there was no, no love 
kind of put into any of the designs. It was just kind of like, all right, let's take a vehicle, let's make a robot, and let's just slap it together, I guess. Very, very bland. You're right. No love whatsoever. Very bland coloring and really no no charisma to any yeah. of them. Well, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I didn't collect them, so I'm relying on you guys to tell me like that, and I, I'll obviously believe you. And I'll have to check out, Jack, this toy, the toys they made us because I've never watched it. So There were, there were no jet fires out oh, there. I'll no, say that. Let me say it. And it's so funny. <laughs> Arthur, I was telling my son today, he was asking me who's my favorite train. I said, jet fire. And he was like, really? Yeah. And I was just like, I was like yeah. he reminds me of like another, you know, from, from you know, Robotech. And I was just like, it's like, he's just so cool. I was. It was. A, but I, I will say this. And, and I said this once in my uh, podcast with Jason, and I may have told James this, but I enjoyed the first Transformers movie. The second one that came out in 2009, I was with my uh, ex-wife and we got in to see uh, the film. We got to see it for free, no less. And the second that Jetfire transformed and we started talking in that in that that voice, we walked. I, I, I said, we have to leave. We have to leave. They will not besmirch my childhood like this. <laughs> and I want you. my money back. <laughs> and, and, and who do I talk to to get my money back? <laughs> Arthur actually said, it's like, here, I'm giving you this money, okay, for that affront. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, that was truly terrible. And the only to this day, to this day, and I'm nearly 50 years old, I have ever, have ever walked out on a film. Wow. That's impressive. Right? That, oh, is, that's impressive. that is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, Keith, let me rephrase the question because Jack, you just brought it up. So, so Keith, I'm going to have you all answer this, but I'm going to take Optimus Prime off the table. So who is your yeah. favorite Transformer? So uh, growing up, I was a big Wheeljack guy. I, I don't know if that means I was destined to be in IT or if uh, my life is just that lame that it's been, uh, you know, from the beginning. But um, I really enjoyed Wheeljack. I Ironhide was OK. I actually kind of like Shockwave, which is probably a weird. Love I Shockwave. Know, I don't know how many people like. Oh, yeah. OK. So there's one. Uh, I, you know, there's literally uh, two of us. Love Shockwave. Um, yeah. Love Shockwave. Well, no, but, uh, third yeah. case, the Shockwave was just cool because as a toy, like you get the cassettes. I loved that. No, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, Shock, he's like the gun, the gun guy on oh, Cybertron, Shockwave. the purple guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I mean, for those of us who also collected the comics, which I, and I did, yes. which was originally supposed to be a four issue limited series. Yeah. Okay. Shockwave came in at the end of issue four, blew up. Everybody, yeah, I mean, Shockwave came was down scary from, in the comic. Killed, killed pretty much all of the Autobots for the most part until they were brought back, like an issue later. <laughs> and then in the next, in the next issue, yeah, I know. And the spoilers. next issue, <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> in the next issue, they 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 picked up uh, the whole series. So it started at issue five. It, it continued for the next like ten years or whatever. But Shockwave was badass. He 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 was the man. Yeah. And also I thought jazz was always interesting because he just he sounded different than really any other autobot. I mean, I know like Soundwave had a weird voice and Chris Lotta doing uh, Starscream was just ridiculous. But, oh, you know, great. Something about um, Scatman doing a uh, Transformer just hit nicely. Yes, that's his last film, too. Right. Wasn't that his yeah, last that film? Was, also? I think Transformers was his last film. Yeah, also. That's like yeah. Casey Kasem yeah. doing Robin. You, those distinctive voices you just don't forget. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Casey Kasem did, right? Yeah. John, who's uh, Optimus Prime off the board? Who's your favorite Transformer? Oh, that's that's a tough one. Um, that's why I didn't I, answer it. With the Gestalt's, just in terms of as the as the toys go, because it was you know, the five you get the big the big one. Um, but when it came to the actual characters, um, I think I think I was really into. Um, Oh, damn, I want to say, I just want to say Optimus again. So I'm like, wait, but that goes back to Optimus Prime again. I had, I had, I also had an obsession. Uh, what, was, what was that? What was the jet dinosaur sky? Skylinks. Uh, Skylinks. Yeah. Because I had the toy. Skylinks. But also, <laughs> but then, like, you think like it's going to be a dinosaur or something. You're not quite sure because of all the, because he's a triple changer. Yeah. That was the big net, triple changer. But then he has this, like, sleek British voice and he's a scientist too. <laughs> And I was there for that. I was just like, oh, okay. Like you're, 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 you're smart too, but you're also a terrifying, you know, dinosaur dragon space shuttle car. And right. <laughs> you know what it comes back to? 
he saved Optimus Prime, brought him back to uh, life. So that's therefore, right. right there, gonna be gonna you know, I think it was just like you 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 you've won me over. You've clearly won okay. me over. So I I, I I simply remember playing with that toy the most. That, that's a good. I I, I like that. Arco, what, I was gonna go to you next. Who was who's your favorite yeah. Transformer? Or you can name a couple like Keith did as well. Well, um, besides Jetfire, I'm gonna say from the show, uh, I I loved. Bumblebee because he had like the most interaction with the humans and everything, but for me, obviously, it's not just the fact that it's Bumblebee because he there was he there wasn't much to him, but it was Spider Man's voice. So that's <laughs> to me because I grew up on Spider Man as Amazing Friends. That was the same actor, a voice actor who did uh, the same voice. So that was a, uh, I always love that. We know it was um, really but, because he was the Orco of the show of Transformers, but it's fine. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but watching the other day, I, I remembered I did have one other, and I don't know where it came from. It may have been my younger brothers. That's what the story I'm going to go with. But I had Astro Train. <laughs> and how oh, crazy nice. is that? How crazy was Astro Train, where he's a train in space and that turned into a space shuttle? And, you know, and, and talk about the mass and everything and where is it going? Because yeah. he's the same size when he's a, when he's a robot, but uh, he's twice the size because he has to <laughs> ferry everybody back and forth. Exactly. And, you know, and exactly. So, I mean, where, where is that happening? So, uh, yeah, I, I remember Astro Train was pretty cool, too. So, that's that pretty much it for me. Oh, that's cool. Jack, are you, is yeah. it just Jetfire, or do you have any of the other options for your favorites? You no, know, uh, so, um, you know, I, I, as a kid, I also had Grimlock, um, uh, T-Rex Grimlock. Um, and that that was, let me tell you, that, that was the weakest-ass transformation, like, ever. Um, it just, I mean, it looks so much cooler in a cartoon. It, in real life, to get it to do that, it's just not. So, again, now having kids who continued watching Beyond Generation 1, um, Transformers Robots in Disguise, uh, I think it ran for three seasons. And that, that one was fun. Uh, they made Bumblebee the main character there, and he, he could speak. Um, I mean, I know he spoke in Generation 1, but apparently this Michael Bay had him as mute or something. I, I, I don't know. This is People are talking. Um, but uh, <laughs> from, from Robots in Disguise, they, they did a lot more characterization uh, of the, 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 the main characters. And so there would probably say... Bumble, the characterization of Bumblebee on that show, and then again, you have kids, you buy those toys. Yep. Um, what yeah. I think the most interesting because uh, he was trying to live up to Prime's, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 legacy that Prime had set. Uh, Optimus Prime came in later on. I mean, and so there's just a lot of kind of a little bit of angst, a little bit of imposter syndrome. I mean, deep deep, deep robot trauma and angst. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, the fact that I only really know the movie, so I, I think if I had to choose... Well, actually, I'm just watching a little bit of the cartoon. I like jazz also. And Keith, I'm with you with the uh, distinctive voice and it being yeah. Scatman Crothers didn't hurt. And also, I think just because I know the movie, I'm going to say I like Cup. I don't know. I like Cup. I like the old timer. I can that see movie. that. Yeah. 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 I mean, Cup, I think Cup is like... Of the new Transformers they gave us, I think I kind of like Cup. I also, I mean, just because I only saw him in the movie, I don't know how good he was afterwards. Probably not great, given what all you've said. But um, Spring, Springer is not a bad character either. He's a, he's a car and he's a helicopter. How bad can that be? Right. But, um, like Cup knew where to get the best drinks. Like he knew what bar was yes. open uh, yes. when, you needed, when you needed a late night. Like that's, that's, that's the kind of mentor he was. And Cup also knew everything oh. except he'd seen everything. Is reminded he'd seen of everything. everything. <laughs> uh, at the at the end, the, it, at Robert, I'm sure somebody somebody goes to him and goes, he goes, well, are, doesn't this remind you of anything? He was like, no, I'm terrified. This it's I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. This shit's crazy. <laughs> 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 I've been alive too long. I've never seen this. <laughs> and he was voiced by what the guy from Heart to Heart. I can't Lionel remember the Stander. Actors. Lionel Stander. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good voice for him too. So, well, I think we, I think we did it. Um, does anyone have any final thoughts or things that we you wanted to touch on or that we didn't touch on regarding Transformers the movie? I just want to give a shout out to Omega Supreme, who was basically the original Bumblebee. Like he <laughs> couldn't speak correctly, and they they did sort of have an episode about why that happened, but it was god awful. And um, they could have done a lot more with like him, the uh, Constructicons, and the whole Crystal City saga. I want to give a shout out to Blur from the movie. So much promise. Oh, John uh, Mashida. Yeah, I mean, they just they just really had 
I mean, once the movie came out, they just had nothing to do with him. I mean, you're talking about a character who's mildly interesting in the movie, maybe because you remember him because he's got his gimmick, uh, and just progressively gets worse on the show. So the micro machine man. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes the micro machine man. Uh, John and Arco, any shout outs or missed things that you want to get into before we wrap things up? Uh, no. <laughs> I pretty much covered it all. I mean, at this point, I'm just uh, circling back to how much I love Voltron, too. So let's not go into that. <laughs> yeah, I feel uh, at this point, I would just be like going back down into that LSD trip that we've just come out oh, of. Oh, yeah, I, I tell you. <laughs> The colors, man. The colors. <laughs> right, well, then I let's. T- okay, so uh, all right, audience. Well, if you've enjoyed this uh, this discussion of Transformers the movie, well, number one, if you if you are interested in it and haven't seen it, it's available on Amazon. Um, it's also also available on YouTube right now. That's how I watched it again. So you can nice. check that out. Uh, but probably if you want to really support it, you should buy it um, and own it. Jack, you own a copy. Jack, you own a copy of it, right? Uh, I, my, my, you know, I, I'm going to pass the book and say my, my kid owns a copy, but yes. <laughs> Your kid owns a copy. I say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, you know, I, I, there's a part of me that just doesn't want to take full ownership of that. <laughs> I, I I own the uh, tin clamshell DVD copy. Oh, so nice. I will the say that. Case. And that was sent to me by a friend. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Keith, what's Thank the you. copy you have? Um... I don't even remember. I, I ended up uh, downloading the digital copy that came with the physical copy that somebody, I think Kevin bought it for me. So it came with like a little poster that shimmers when you look at it differently. And, and then I promptly threw it in the closet and downloaded the digital copy. Again. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, nice. Yes, Sorry, yes, guys. Nice. <laughs> John, do you own a copy of the movie? Uh, I do. I have, I have a DVD that I purchased uh, in like 99 and I subjected uh, my college friends to. Uh, at the time, and they, they they had not seen it at all, and there we were, uh, uh, you know. And I wasn't drinking very much at the time, but they all needed to get drunk after uh, drunk after that movie. Um, uh, we ended up making it a regular thing, like once a semester to watch that movie afterwards. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. So, audience, after all of that, uh, obviously, when you watch this movie, it's it's a little bit of a trip. So, hang in there. If you have young kids, maybe not show them this because it might traumatize them. And uh, <laughs> we turned out fine. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. and we didn't wear seatbelts. <laughs> That's right. My Bob. parents smoked in the car with the windows down. <laughs> well, on that note, let me uh, thank my uh, expert panel. Um, thank you, uh, Arco, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for being here. A pleasure, as always. John, thank you. Also a pleasure. And uh, Keith, thank you. And I hope you've enjoyed your first time on the show. Yes, I was excellent. Thank you. No, I'm mean, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for hosting. And uh, audience, uh, also, it looks like we'll have to do GI Joe the movie at some point too. So uh, we'll we'll tease that at some point. But if you have any comments or thoughts about Transformers the movie, please uh, go to the Facebook page, Secret Origins and Mint Condition, and leave your thoughts and comments when this episode is dropped. If you want to follow us on Instagram, it's Secret Origins MC, and you can uh, leave your comments there. And if you want to email us directly, it's Secret Origins MC at Gmail dot com. I thank you for listening, and till all are one. Till all are one. one. (laughs) Very good.